السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless his entire household and all his companions May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless them all and bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness and forgiveness on this beautiful eve. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to make the most of this beautiful month of Ramadan. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, sometimes when we enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to engage in prayer, we want to involve in some dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps we want to read a little bit of the Qur'an. Perhaps we would like to maybe get closer to someone who has a little bit of knowledge and listen to something that is beneficial from them. What we need to bear in mind is never disturb others in the same house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are going to read the Quran, do not read it in a way that the others who want to, for example, fulfill salah, they will be disturbed. Yes, if it is, if it is a congregational prayer, then there is nothing you can do about it. You have to follow and perhaps it will be loud enough for everyone to hear. But if you are doing an individual act of worship, be considerate of the others. This is something very important. It's important for us to strike the balance. So I don't need to read so softly that I cannot hear myself. And I don't need to read so loudly that a person next to me would perhaps curse me because of how loud I'm reading and the fact that I may be disturbing them. Now, there is a totally different example in the verse that I will be reading first this evening. At the end of Surah Al-Isra, verse number 110, there is a hadith, muttafaq alayh, of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and another one of Aisha radiallahu anha. The narration of Aisha radiallahu anha says, when it comes to dua and supplication, you need to know that Allah hears you. You don't need to scream and yell at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No need to shout at Allah. You don't have to start raising your voice and screaming as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not listening to you. And you need to know the best is a person who strikes the balance. You're not so quiet that you're just saying it in your mind. You know, we are taught that Allah knows what's in your mind before you utter it, right? That does not mean you should not utter the dua. You should attempt to utter it. You should say it. You should try it. But sometimes you might not be able to word it so perfectly. Sometimes you might not be able to say it exactly the way you want it. Then Allah knows. But you try. Because that attempt is an act of worship. To be able to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something great. So when we are making dua, neither do we yell, nor are we silent completely. But in between, we try. We say it in a beautiful tone, in a beautiful uh, manner. And the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu also muttafaq alayh. He says when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to lead some of his companions in Makkah al-Mukarramah radiallahu anhum, then he used to read Quran a little bit loud. So some of the mushrikeen, some of the disbelievers, when they used to listen to some of the Quran, some of them used to curse the Quran. And they used to curse the one who revealed it, and the one who came with it, and the one whom it was revealed upon, and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, verse number 110. Do not raise your voice so much when it comes to a salah. Salah refers to two things here. One is dua, which means supplication. And two is the recitation of Quran in the prayer. So don't raise your voice so much and do not drop it so low, but seek a middle course between the two so that it is something very good, which doesn't disturb those who don't want to listen to it. And it does not become too silent that those who need to listen to it cannot hear. You know, if I'm an imam, for example, nowadays, mashallah, we have this microphone that helps us. But if I'm an imam and I have four people behind me, there is a certain volume I may read with. And if there are 400 people behind me, I will have to raise my voice. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He grant us acceptance and an understanding. Look at how beautifully the Quran has advised the companions as well as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as well as all of us. And look at Allah's love for us. He's telling us, look, it's a middle course that you need to adopt. 
May Allah help us adopt this middle course in everything that we do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us the good. And may Allah forgive us any errors and mistakes we may have made. Ameen. Surah Al-Kahf is the next surah that we will be going through. Just perhaps a verse of, or two of that particular surah. There is a narration regarding the surah itself. It's named after the cave. The reason is, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was in Makkah al-Mukarramah, this is mentioned by Ibn Kathir in his tafsir, narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He says, the mushriks of Makkah, they wanted to challenge him regarding the contents of the Qur'an. But because they did not have knowledge of the previous scriptures, they sent a delegation to Medina Munawwara, a top delegation. The delegation went to meet the Jewish people in Medina and the people of the book. What was the reason? The reason was those people had scriptures, heavenly scriptures. And the people of Mecca knew that if we want to confirm that this too is heavenly, we need to go and ask those people what it's all about and tell them what our man has come with, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and ask them how can we catch him or how can we uh, try and confirm that he is or is not a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they went and the Jewish people got together and they told them what to ask him. So from among the questions they said, go and ask him three things. If he's a prophet, he'll bring the answers. What are the three things? The first thing is, ask him about a group of youth that lived a long, long time back. Meaning the people of the cave, subhanallah. Ask him about them. And the second thing, ask him about a man who traveled from the east to the west. A man that traversed the land. He had lots of authority and he traveled from the east to the west. And the third thing, ask him about the soul, the ruh. We spoke about it yesterday. Ask him about the soul. So these are the three questions. These people were happy. Like little children, they came back to Makkah al-Mukarramah. Yes, we're going to get you now. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. They didn't realize that they were playing a game. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from taking things lightly that are meant to be serious. Amen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously revealing to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was asked the questions, these three questions, he said, I will tell you tomorrow. But sadly, unfortunately, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some reason Allah knows best why, he forgot to say inshallah. You know, you and I are taught that when you want to do something related to the near future or the distant future, you need to always connect it to the will of the Almighty. So if I say, I will see you in five minutes, I need to say, by the will of Allah, inshallah. That's what we are taught as believers, right? So if I say, we will see you again here tomorrow, I don't have a guarantee I'm going to be here. Something could happen that might stop me from coming. I don't know what. I have a plan to come, yes. So I just say, by the will of Allah. If Allah wills, He will give me the energy and I'm going to be here. By the will of Allah, we will meet tomorrow. Alhamdulillah. But if I don't say by the will of Allah, it is an error in the sense that it is something that is not ideal. A mu'min is taught to always relate things connected to the near or distant future to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, when it happened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it did not happen because it was a mistake on his part. Rather, it happened so that verses could be revealed to teach the rest of the ummah, including us, a beautiful lesson. Amazing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regarding the verses that were, or the questions that were asked by the kuffar of Quraysh, that they had imported from Medina, Munawwara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided not to reveal for a period of 15 nights. The answers didn't come. But you told us you were going to answer us the next day. Well, the answers did not come. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was really yearning and waiting for the answers. And he wanted to respond. He wanted to respond to this delegation of Makkah al-Mukarramah that had gone to Medina Munawwara. And he was feeling it so heavy within himself. He wanted to see them be guided. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter, 15 days later, revealed the verses with the responses one after the other. So in Surah Al-Kahf, you have the story of those who were in the cave, the youth, right? You have the story of Dhul Qarnayn, the one who traversed the land from the east to the west and he had authority. And you also have the answer as to the ruh and the soul, where it comes from and what is it exactly. So Allah explains that it is the instruction of Allah. Allah will not give you knowledge that he does not want to give you, O mankind. Because the knowledge we have in comparison to the knowledge of Allah, as we said yesterday, 
we cannot begin to compare. That's how it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And at the same time, verse number 6, Allah says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِن لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفًا Perhaps you will harm yourself grieving over them if they don't accept this beautiful speech and the Quran. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa used to worry so much about the disbelievers and their comments and he used to desperately want them to see the light so much so that Allah warns him to say, you're going to harm yourself. Brothers and sisters, what we learn from this is sometimes Allah has placed on our shoulders a duty. Let me give you a typical example. To look after our children is our duty. It's placed on our shoulders. The children are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as they grow up, you name them, you give them good clothing, you give them a good upbringing, you teach them manners, you teach them the Quran, you try your best. There are certain things at a certain age that will get beyond your control. There's nothing you can do about it. They are now adults. They've chosen a path that perhaps might be wrong. May Allah forgive us. You may be able to remind them and so on, but you will not be able to treat them as though they were two-year-old little children. They are now adults. They've chosen a path. It's up to them. So yes, we do grieve, but you don't grieve to the extent that you become depressed and you become a case yourself that requires medication. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It happens to people. We grieve so much regarding things that are beyond our control. It's not in your control. Leave it. It's Allah's test for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah not test us with tests that are too difficult for us to pass, my brothers and sisters. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he desperately wanted to see guidance. Allah says, well, if we haven't written guidance for them, that's it. The door is closed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So the same applies. You want certain things your way. They will not happen your way. That's Allah's plan. So don't start depressing yourself about it. Get used to the fact that you're not the only person in existence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah grant us a deep understanding. These are beautiful lessons. Yes, the reasons of revelation may have been slightly different, but the lessons we draw from them, applicable in my life and yours. My brothers and sisters, we see in community, in society, the downgrade in terms of spirituality. We witness it. We see it live. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But at the same time, there are certain things you can do. You can remind a person, you can talk to them, you, you can perhaps continue to say a good word or two. But you will never ever be able to provide that guidance that is in control of Allah for that person. You may want to make dua. So remember, anything in your capacity, get it done. The rest, leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah help us. May Allah grant us sanity. May Allah help us rectify our own weaknesses and illness. And then verse number 23 and 24 connected to that, inshallah, we spoke about a few minutes ago, by the will of Allah. So Allah says, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ Do not say that you are going to do something in the near future or distant future except by adding to it by the will of Allah, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember Allah if you forget to say that. Say for example, I forgot to say inshallah and I told you, I'll see you tomorrow. And as I walk away, I need to remember Allah. If I remembered that I forgot to say inshallah, I need to now say it whenever I remember or at least remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I say astaghfirullah, subhanallah, all praise is due to Allah. May Allah forgive me. Insha'Allah and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us moisten our tongues with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for indeed it is the best, the best you can offer your own tongues. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. That was a narration of Ibn Kathir uh, reported by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Then we have the last few verses of this surah, Surah Al-Kahf. There's a very interesting lesson that we learn from some of the reasons of revelation and there are many narrations, some of them are weak, some of them are a little bit stronger, but they point in one direction, and that is the people who engage in acts of worship, and then they like to be reminded about how good their act of worship was. Sometimes, you know, you're reading salah. Now I'm coming to our, our own life, right? You're, you're fulfilling your prayer, 
and you're standing and suddenly, you know, your father walks in and now, <clears throat> you know, you're standing a little bit more calm, you know, because as a youngster, people are worried about their dads, you know, and sometimes you're in the masjid and you're standing in salah. I recall, and I'm not joking with you, you know, we have a bad habit. As Muslimin, we are supposed to be looking down when we're reading salah. Sometimes people are just looking everywhere, beautiful masjid. You, I wonder what this chandelier costed. Okay. And you're looking at this. If only I could have a fraction of the money they used for those bricks there, I'd be a loaded man. Subhanallah. And we don't realize this is a distraction. Don't do that. Look down. So I remember when I was young, there was a certain man, an uncle I knew. He had a habit of looking up. And as a kid, we thought we we're going to fix him up. So we were walking past him and we greeted him. And he did this. And then he realized he was in salah and he quickly looked down. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for playing the fool. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him for looking up as well. Amen. <laughs> So the reality is, we tend sometimes to become a little bit more conscious of our deed because people are watching. It happens, doesn't it? People are watching. You know, you give a charity quietly, no one knows. And then people hear you've given a big figure and, and you just start <coughs> clearing your throat, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May that not be the case. So obviously there are reminders in the Quran. The Quran reminds us only because it's normal for shaitan to come and try and attack you and me. Normal. Shaitan's job is to attack. And Allah's job is to forgive. Or part of Allah's mercy is to forgive. Shaitan's job is to distract, to try and attack us. And Allah's mercy dictates that for as long as we turn to him, he keeps on forgiving. Subhanallah. Look at that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Verse number 110, Surah Al-Kahf. Allah says, whoever is looking forward to the meeting with Allah, I'm looking forward to the meeting with my maker, and I hope you are too. Then you need to do two things. The first is do good deeds. And the translation of the term good deeds means acts of worship that were taught by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You want, you are looking forward to meeting with Allah, the one who was at the top of the entire list and still remains at the top of the list is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He knows he will meet Allah subhanahu wa taala. He will be the first to actually be resurrected and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent him to us to teach us how Allah wants to be worshipped. So we will worship Allah according to the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's number one. The second thing you need to do, you need to protect yourself from associating partners with Allah. وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Never ever associate partners with Allah in worship or the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship Allah and Allah alone. And this is how we will be able to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good condition. So the issue of rectifying an act of worship because people are watching, the minute you become conscious of what you just did, you quickly turn back to Allah. Astaghfirullah, oh Allah, forgive me for that. I believe in you and you alone and I render acts of worship to you alone. Don't let shaitan bog you down by making you think that now that these evil thoughts came into your mind, that's it, you are doomed. No, you are not doomed. You go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With Allah, you keep on going back and keep on going back. And you know what? The best thing of all, the mercy of Allah dictates that your exam result will be based on the final answer you wrote. Not on what you wrote while you were still in the exam room. But right at the end, before you handed in your paper, what was your condition? That's what Allah will judge you according to. So if you've committed sin all your life, but at the end you changed and you repented, your result is according to the repentance. And if you commit, if you did good deeds all your life, and at the end you quit all the good deeds and went back into the clubs or, or, or went to the clubs for the first time and discarded the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be judged according to the end. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The end is what counts. You know, something that comes to my mind is football. A lot of people love football. They can score what they want at the beginning of the match. It depends what the score is at the end. Am I right? Sorry to give you that example, but people know about it more than anything else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I remember a youngster tell me, please, I need something. And I'm like, I wonder what's going on. Please, I need. And this youngster was looking distressed, like depressed. Someone passed away or something. Make dua, my team wins. Make dua, my team wins. <laughs> And I'm like, are you serious? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. People have taken it to another level. 
May Allah help us to be able to strike a balance. No one is saying sports is bad. But sometimes the way we treat it, it becomes bad for us because we've lost balance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us with that beautiful balance. Let's move on to Surah Maryam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a verse which clarifies for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the position of the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with revelation. It was awesome. It was beautiful because imagine something happens, the next thing Jibreel alayhi salam comes and everything is cleared and clarified. The verse is recited and that's it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mashallah tabarakallah. So according to a narration, of Bukhari as well as Sunan Al-Tirmidhi, Sunan Al-Nasai, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa once told Jibreel alayhi salam, O Jibreel, can't you or what is stopping you from coming to us more often than you actually do come? You know what this means? We want to see you a bit more, subhanallah. Look at the beauty. The best company for a Prophet is an angel. Do you know that? I mean, can there be something... If one was to choose, we would choose brilliant company in terms of those who will benefit us in every single way. What would be beautiful company for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In fact, beautiful company for Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam. Seeing that the status of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is higher than the angels. Subhanallah. So the point I learn is if Muhammad, peace be upon him, is telling Jibreel, we want to see you more often. Surely for me, those who are good and pious and bring me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, I should be wanting to see them more often. I should be wanting to listen to them more often. I should be wanting to be in their company more often so that I feel a blessed person all the time. May Allah help us all achieve the best of company. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, company plays a big role in the type of person you end up becoming. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Sometimes because of the schools our parents have chosen to send us to, we become a certain type of person. Sometimes because of the suburb that our parents have chosen to live in, we become a certain type of a person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam responds, verse number 64 of Surah Maryam. وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ لَهُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيْنَا وَمَا خَلْفَنَا وَمَا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيًّا We only descend as per the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As per the instruction of your Lord. So Jibreel alayhi salam is saying, I cannot come down on my own. And this is a beautiful answer because it shows that Jibreel alayhi salam is explaining, I am acting according to the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't come on my own accord. Perhaps if he were to come down on his own accord, he may have come down much more because he would have also wanted to be in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But this is the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says to him, meaning to your Rabb, belongs what is in front, what is behind. Absolutely everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's not forgetful. Allah does not forget anything. So these are beautiful verses connected to uh, this beautiful uh, incident that occurred at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then we have another incident of a man known as Ubay ibn Khalaf. He constantly used to argue and debate in Mecca al Mukarramah. And he used to say, when we are buried and when we are decomposed in the soil, then are you claiming that there is a Lord who is going to bring all that decomposed human back into life? You know, to this day, there are people who don't believe in resurrection. There are people who think, you know what, this is the world, that's it. You know, you die and it's over, the story is over. So from that time, there were people like that. One of them was Ubay ibn Khalaf. And he says, are you claiming that we're going to be resurrected? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed several verses clarifying this. One of them was verse number 66. Man is saying, when I die, is it possible for me to be resurrected alive once again? When I die, is it possible for me to be resurrected alive again? Tell them. أَوَلَا يَذْكُرُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا 
does man not remember that we created him before from nothing? For Allah to create from nothing was simple. So for him to bring back something that's there in the decomposed form is even easier. Subhanallah. You know, to, to, to buy the vehicle is, is one thing. And I'm giving you an example in our own lives. You know, you have the money to buy a vehicle. When you have a little dent here or there, to, to panel beat it is far more simple. Less people are needed. People with less expertise are needed. Because now you only need to panel beat it. Subhanallah. But what about the initial vehicle and its invention and so on? Man is far more sophisticated. Allah does not invent, but He creates. That's the difference. You know, man says, I created this, I created. No, man, you created nothing. All you did is you transformed one creature of Allah into another. So you went into the mountains, you dug, and you transformed something that looked a little bit like sand maybe into something that is now steel and metal. And from there you perhaps might have designed it a bit and made it into the shape of a vehicle. And some of it, the wires and whatever else connected and the electricity and so on. You created nothing. You only invented. You changed the creation of Allah from one state to another. But Allah created from nothing. Subhanallah. This is why Allah says, when He wants, He says, be, and it is. Let's try. Can anyone say, be? Wallahi, we would take them to the mad hospital. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Amen. So this was a response to those who were saying that we're not going to be resurrected. And then there was another fool from amongst the people of Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. And his name was Al-As ibn Wa'il. Al-As ibn Wa'il. He was one of those who really hated the Muslims. And this is a hadith muttafaq alayhi, reported by Khabbab ibn al-Arat. Khabbab ibn al-Arat was a poor man. He had been enslaved at one stage. And Khabbab ibn al-Arat accepted Islam at the very beginning. But he was a master in terms of uh, being a blacksmith. And he used to make the best swords, the best swords. Everyone knew this sword is Khabbab ibn al-Arat. So a lot of the top people, they did not want to spoil their relationship with him because they knew, hey, we need weaponry from this man. So what happened is, they used to deal with him, they used to take the weaponry and some of them used to pay him back after some time. One of them was Al-As ibn Wa'il. He owed Khabbab ibn al-Arat some money. And Khabbab ibn al-Arat went to now claim the money, to collect it, to say, you know what, don't do this. You owe me the money and I need the money. So he says, I'll give you the money on condition that you disbelieve in Muhammad wasallam. Khabbab ibn al-Arat says, I'll never do that. Not at all. He says, well, then you're not getting your money. He says, I'll never disbelieve in Muhammad. You die, I still won't give it up. You be resurrected, I still won't give it up. He says, what? We're going to be resurrected. He says, yes, we're going to be resurrected. Okay, so now I have a deal for you. When, when I'm resurrected, I'll have money and children. And when I have the money, then I'll pay you. So meet me on the other side. <laughs> what a fool. Look at how he wants to run away from it. Al-As ibn Wa'il telling Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu an, and this is hadith muttafaq alayh, that I'll see you on the other side, I'll have money and I'll have children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals verse number 77, speaking about this and clarifying the position. Have you seen the one who has disbelieved in our signs? وَقَالَ لَأُوتَيَنَّ مَا وَوَلَدًا and he says, I will definitely get money and children on the other side. Which means, when I'm resurrected, I'm going to get. Allah says, do you see this man? You see his comment. You see what he is saying. Has he witnessed the unseen? Or has he taken a promise and a covenant from Allah? He doesn't believe in it on one hand. and the other hand, he's claiming, I'm going to be there and I'm going to get it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... Forgive us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. These are some of the foolish statements of the people who had uh, disbelieved from among those in Makkah al Mukarramah who used to challenge the believers. To this day, there are people who challenge us with matters that are petty. Sometimes because we don't have knowledge, we think it's a major issue. They pick on the, the treatment of women in Islam. They pick on perhaps the issue of inheritance in Islam. They pick on so many other things. Wallahi, these people don't know any better. If you take a look at the women and how they're being treated, Wallahi, if you look at the globe today, a lot of women don't even realize that they've been enslaved without knowing they've been enslaved. 
So the way they dress is solely and only to please the eye of the opposite sex. Some designer who happens to be somewhere across the globe, who's a male who needs to see you as a sex object. So he's given you a cut that shows your entire legs and your cleavage and whatnot. And you don't know that's not liberation. That in fact is being enslaved totally with a PhD. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Really. Enslaved totally. You cannot go to the door to answer the door when the sister comes to the door because you don't have the makeup that you're enslaved by. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May He make us from among those who understand and realize the liberation there is in putting on a cloak. Subhanallah. You're not judged by your shape, by the type of clothing, by the design of this and the sense, the smell and so on. You, you are not judged by anyone besides whom you really are, your character, your conduct and what you have to offer. Today people see a woman slightly overweight and they don't want to look in her direction because she may be the best of all women. But they've been trained and enslaved to think, you know what? No ways, don't even look in that direction. Why? What an insult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I'm not saying you should look. <laughs> it's just a point I'm raising. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He forgive us. My brothers and sisters, these are some beautiful points. I want to end off with the last verse here. Uh, verse number... In fact... I think we will end at that. The time is up and inshallah we hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us goodness and ease. Like I said, my brothers and sisters, more important than anything is the lesson we draw in our own lives. Let's become people who understand the way to salvation is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is a beautiful faith, free from all forms of negativity, free of bad teachings and that which is evil. In fact, it is a religion that brings about inner and outer peace. May Allah grant that to us. Inshallah, inshallah, we meet again tomorrow. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.